welcome to a special edition of Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. On today's broadcast, Andrew is joined by David and Tim Barton as they discuss America's systemically anti-racist heritage. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to another special uh, Gospel Truth program. I've been interviewing David and Tim Barton for, I think this is our seventh day, if I'm not mistaken. And we have been just trying to counter a lot of the lies, I mean flat out lies being said about America, how we're systemically racist, going back and tracing everything. We've talked about the 1619 Project, and just a lot of things. And I really specifically position these programs around Thanksgiving, because I think Thanksgiving, man, this is a godly holiday. We ought to be praising God for this nation and the people who put their lives in jeopardy to be able to give us what we've got. And today, it's just being trashed. And so the Bartons have been uh, helping us uh, put things into their proper perspective. And I just want to thank you all for, I can't even imagine the hours, the years that you've put into learning all this information. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. And again, let me advertise wallbuilders.com. They have a lot of information there. I mean, thousands of articles, and you can go research everything they're saying. And they have all of these original documents. I mean, the largest private collection in the mm -hmm. world, I assume, of American early Documents. That's largely what we're told, with about 160,000 artifacts from American history, uh, probably 100 to 120,000 of them from before 1812. Um, and so we're, and that's part of what we try to bring with us some on the set, but also where we try to tell the story is from the original documents. And, and for people who have been following maybe the last several days, or maybe they'll go back and watch some, one of the things I would encourage them is on the wallbuilders.com website, we have a book called The American Story, where we really go into detail of Jamestown and Plymouth uh, with some of the heroes, some of the villains, but just a true story Today, so much of what we are hearing is, is not the truth. And we know where Jesus said that you shall know the truth, the truth shall set you free. Um, our nation is in bondage right now to lies. That's and, right. and we need to know the truth. And part of what we encourage people to do is that we don't necessarily need Congress to know the truth. We need people to know the truth because when we as the body of Christ begin to know the truth, we can start teaching the truth. And then that's what disseminates throughout the nation. Uh, we don't need a national solution. We need a groundswell solution. Well, if we knew the truth, we wouldn't be electing senators That's who right. sit there and say that slavery started with the murder. Correct. That mm -hmm. is dumb to the second it is. power. It, it is <laughs> so right, ridiculous. So today's our last day. What can you guys bring to bear on this to help us understand how that this really is a godly nation? So I, I think we definitely want to finish with talking about some of the legacy of the pilgrims. We've already talked about some of their relations with the Native Americans, uh, how they started this notion of respecting private property, and they only took uh, things or exchanged what they had bought from the Indians. They didn't steal from the Indians. Uh, we've talked a little bit about education. We talked about the free market. Uh, and there's still multiple other things mm -hmm. we can get into from the and legacy Tim, of the And let me programs. just interrupt for a second. I know there's people that watch one program and they haven't seen the whole thing. And you just said they didn't steal from the Indians. I bet you that 90% of the people would disagree with that because there are instances sure, there where were. they did steal. But that's taken out of context. You talked about for what, 50 years? Right. That there was total peace? Four years, the longest lasting treaty in American history between Anglos and Native Americans were the Pilgrims. And the Pilgrims have, they account for records that they do not have a square foot of land that they didn't buy. So we aren't denying that there was bad things done to the Indians, but we're saying that's not systemic. Right. Mm -hmm. That's not the way it started. There's always been abuses. Well, and them. this is also the difference between Jamestown and Plymouth, where we talked about a lot over the last several programs is that certainly there was a lot less biblical mentality in Jamestown. And, and anytime you see people that are not walking according to biblical truth or biblical principles, then you're going to have much more sinful, wicked, evil behavior. And so because there are people all over the world, there was these things happening all over the world. And certainly in American history, those things happened. But the legacy of Plymouth was very, very different because that's not the norm of what you saw in Plymouth. That might have happened once or twice. Those were the aberrations. Jamestown, that might have little, been a little bit more normal than the aberration. But this is where uh, the point that we would make is if you look at the first Thanksgiving, right? The notion that the pilgrims were stealing land from the natives. No, no, no. The first Thanksgiving, there were 53 pilgrims. There was Chief Massasoit and 90 Indian braves who were there. Of the 53 pilgrims, only 22 of them were adult males. So had the Indians felt like they had been cheated or had land stolen from them, 
they easily could have taken it back that first Thanksgiving. Instead, that first Thanksgiving was a three-day feast where the Indians stayed with the pilgrims for three days. They had athletic competitions. They had races and wrestling matches and shooting competitions. So much they did for three days together. So even just looking at the basic history dispels a lot of the narrative of what's being told today. And again, not to say that there weren't bad things that happened, but that's not the whole story. Again, it's wrong for them to paint a broad picture correct. that America is just right. this way, and Funda that's what's being done. Fundamentally, up until up until more of the, the Jacksonian era, with Andrew Jackson being president, up until the Jacksonian era, it was always the aberration. It was not the norm for land to be stolen from the Indians. The norm, especially from the New England colonies, was that land was purchased from the Indians. Let me ask you a question, and this is just totally personal and maybe off the subject, but I've always had this question. Andrew Jackson did a bunch of bad stuff. He, did. he was a slave owner, and he pushed through a lot of these bad things, but he also intervened in the finances because they had a national bank that was bad. And, I, and that was a good thing, wasn't it? Or was it? Yes. He, there was a lot so of good he things did he did. So he did some good. He did. If you look at the like War of 18... Like most people, he did some good. <laughs> there were some bad, but he did... And I know he this did is not off come the to, uh, The account is that he came to Christ really late in life, really late, long after he left the White House, uh, large part because of his wife leaning on him. But he's not baptized. He doesn't come to Christ till after, long after he's out of the White House. He's an old man when that happens. Oh, so you think he was a brother in the Lord? I think he could at have been. The, at the very well, end of his life. Well, if we see him in heaven, I'll apologize mm -hmm. for all the bad things I've <laughs> well, said about Well, no, him. he still did the bad things. <laughs> it's like but, Paul did bad things before he was converted. Right. Correct. And, and this is one of the things, too, that, that even looking like Andrew Jackson at the War of 1812, he's the hero of the Battle of New Orleans. There, there's a lot of good things he contributed to America without question. However, because he didn't have the biblical foundation of those biblical principles, there was a lot of things that he advocated and promoted that were very immoral things. And this is not unique for Andrew Jackson. It's true for people who don't follow biblical principles. And there's many times in our nation's history that we had leaders that didn't follow those biblical principles. I bet you if you were to take Patricia Cullors and co-founder of Black Lives Matter and on and on, you could go all of these people who are pushing these different narratives. And if you just dug into their history and pulled things out about them sure. and used that to characterize them, man, they'd be lynched. Well, and it's, it's, I mean, even like the history of our vice president, Kamala Harris, where her ancestors had slaves, right? From, uh, I think Jamaica is where they were. Big plantation and, they owned. And, and this, oh, is the, wow. <laughs> this is the reality is that because we know that all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God, you don't have to look very far in anybody's life to find the fact that they're not perfect. And this is where, when we look at history today, one of the, the, the great faults of the modern take of history is that if you can find an imperfection in somebody, then we should cancel mm -hmm. them. When the reality is our expectation is that we will always find imperfections in people Instead, we should look at history, not just to see imperfect people, but instead look to see how a perfect God used those imperfect people and did really special things through them. And that's part of, again, the legacy of Plymouth and the pilgrims is what God established through them, the legacy that trickled over all of America. In fact, even if we think of things in America, um, when you look at the Bill of Rights, we have what are known as the due process clauses of the Bill of Rights. It's very interesting to think about, well, where did where do those notions of due process really come from? And this is where even today, people who have done the research, even if they're secular historians, secular professors, or secular judges, will acknowledge that a lot of those provisions in the due process came directly from the Bible. Yeah, well, they came from the Bible stone. and from that New England colony. And one of the things you will find, I've been chosen a lot of states to do the state standards for social studies and history in those states, state boards of education, governors, et cetera, I get appointed. And every textbook I review to go on through will always make sure to cover the witch trials of Massachusetts. All those Christians up there got here looking for religious liberty and they killed people who disagreed with them. And there is no question, witch trials of Massachusetts, yeah. and we've been talking about how many good things came out of Massachusetts, the witch trials occurred. They occurred for 18 months in 1691, 1692. Over those 18 months, 27 were put to death. And that's, or, or died, so to speak. Yeah, they, the 27 died. Some committed suicide in prison awaiting execution. So 27 died as a result of them. And that is a blemish, that's an atrocity, and that's on those Christians up there, except that's not the end of the story. The end of the story is that there were, let me, let me say it this way. Why did the witch trials stop after 18 months and why after 27 deaths? Because in the rest of the world, witch trials were also occurring. And you'll find that in Europe, 500,000 were put to death in Europe. So you look in 500,000 in Europe, and then these European settlers come over here 
and it's 27. So why 500,000, why 27? And the witch trials lasted far longer decades in Europe. Decades in Europe, decades. So, so they were, the witch trials were stopped in America while they were continuing in Europe. So, so why were they stopped in America? And this is where we've, we've pointed out, you pick any atrocity you want in American history and just ask the question, why did those things stop? Or how did they come to an end? Or who was leading the opposition against those? And this is where it's interesting because this again, is when you look at the witch trials in Massachusetts, well, why were they stopped? Why didn't we continue with executing witches? And they were stopped largely at the influence of three Christian leaders. Three Christian leaders, the Reverend John Wise, the Reverend Increase Mather, and Thomas Brattle went to Governor Phipps and said, Phipps, what you're doing here in these trials violates the biblical process of due rights. In the Bible, we're told in John 8, you have a right to confront your accuser. You're not letting these people call, confront their accusers. We're told in, in Proverbs 18, 17, that one side sounds good until you hear the other. You're not letting them call witnesses in their behalf. You're only letting one side go. You're doing what they're doing in Europe. We came here to get away from Europe. You're doing the same thing. And Governor Phipps looked and said, you are right. And so Governor Phipps called in Judge Samuel Sewell, who was over the trials, said, Sewell, look at this, we've goofed it up. And so what happened was they stopped the trials. Samuel Sewell stood up in church the next week and repented in front of the congregation for having shed innocent blood, not following biblical principles on due process. Wow. The governor then called a colony-wide day of humiliation, fasting, and prayer, seeking to avert God's judgment from coming on the colony because they had shed innocent blood. And then the legislature turned around and, and gave restitution to every family that had had a death, and they exonerated their names and said there is no blemish on The trials were all wrong. They were all false. They were all fake. There's been no crime. Boy, you don't hear this. Stuff. You I'm do like, not that's hear the that. first time I've ever heard. You do this. not hear that. But see, what's interesting I is I went to Salem and read all of their plaques and why oh, they're yeah. proud of stuff, those trials. And they did not present this they stuff. Did. Now, did. what's interesting is Justice Breyer, Stephen Breyer, is certainly one of the most secular justices in Supreme Court history. And yet he had a decision where he says, well, of course, we know that all due process rights in the Constitution came out of the Bible. Run that by me again. What, what did Jesus say? And he was secular. And he was secular. And he said, we know that. And, and so I looked at his footnote and he cited this book right here. Now, this is federal practice and procedure. So if you practice federal law, this thing goes from here halfway around the world. It's just volumes of federal law. And e each volume has different topics. So it's interesting. This covers hearsay uh, policy. So interesting. In the midst of due process, the hearsay policy, and that's obviously what was happening with the witch trials up in Massachusetts, that somebody had said, hey, I think they're a witch, and they weren't allowed to call witnesses in their behalf. They weren't allowed to actually testify in their behalf on some occasions. And so the hearsay policy, but this is what he points back to saying, we know that all of the due process rights came out of the Bible, and this is where it's documented in federal practice and procedures. This federal law book has nearly 20 pages giving the Bible verses that led to the fourth through eighth amendment due process rights mm -hmm. that we have. So there's another legacy of the pilgrims that people don't know today. They don't have any clue where it came from. One, one of the famous examples that is used of hearsay policy is John chapter eight. It was the woman caught in adultery, where right at the end of Jesus writing in the sand, and they've all gone, woman, where are your accusers? She says, there's none. He says, well, then I don't condemn you either. Go your way and sin no more. One of the things they pointed out is you have the right to confront your accusers. Well, that was a biblical idea, but this was also one of the things that was pointed out to the judge, uh, to the Samuel Sewell, who was the guy over, overseeing what was going on. It was pointed out to Governor Phipps, like, guys, we're not following basic biblical rules of evidence. And that changed in Massachusetts, but that became a standard of American law, that you were always able to confront your accuser. It's due process rights, but it literally came from the Bible but that notion was first realized and tried out of Massachusetts where when it was first happening, it was not a good thing. But this is even again where people talk about, well, America did so many bad things. There's no question. America's had many sinful, wicked, evil moments, but people don't talk about why did those sinful, wicked, evil moments stop? Yeah. It was always because of Christians who understood the Bible, who applied biblical truth, who stopped those things in America. And then America was better for it because we said, we're gonna change our policy to make sure we never do it again. And that's why we have these biblical rules of evidence even today in our due process rights. And if we were following the Word of God right here in Deuteronomy 19, mm -hmm. you have to have two or three witnesses. witnesses. If one person accuses that's you right. and it can't be verified, then you do to them what they chose to do yes, to the other that's right. person. That's right. If we applied that to Kavanaugh, mm -hmm. oh, then man. I guarantee you that lady that accused him would have been yep. 
hung. M- that, multiple yeah. of people that were accusing him. Yeah. And, and this is what's so interesting as, as we are now getting ready to celebrate Thanksgiving, which we have talked about so much, how it's one of our favorite celebrations and yeah. favorite holidays in America. Looking at this, when you look at literally the legacy of the, of the pilgrims of Plymouth, there is so much good that came out of Plymouth, so much to be thankful for. And one of the things that has long been a tradition in American history, that the pilgrims are credited with the first Thanksgiving in America, which I guess technically, historically, we could argue it wasn't really the first Thanksgiving. There were multiple times before that people thanked God for moments. You had Thanksgivings at, at St. Augustine in the 1560s. You had it in El Paso in 1590. Uh, you had 1540, Palo Duro Canyon, Texas. They had well, Thanksgivings, but they were just little short services. I mean, you, yeah, when Columbus prayers discovers a new world, he thanks God for discovering the new world. There, there were days of Thanksgiving before, but as far as like our modern tradition, Thanksgiving where there's feasting, there's celebration, there's activities, certainly that goes back to the pilgrims, but they started a tradition. And, and we've talked about the map several times where the legacy of Plymouth and the legacy of Jamestown is very different. One of the legacies of Plymouth that went through the vast majority of colonies and especially the Northern colonies was a tradition of having prayer proclamations, but specifically prayer and thanksgiving proclamations. And we at Wall Builders have a lot of really fun original proclamations. This is a copy of the very first printing of the very first federal thanksgiving proclamation by George Washington, which when Congress finally was able, and actually this was a Constitution Convention, when they finally got the Constitution done, it was only to be ratified by certain states if they agreed to put a Bill of Rights to it. So when the Washington is finally sworn in as president, the Congress finally meets, the Congress's first job is to do a Bill of Rights. So they drafted a Bill of Rights. There were initially 12 amendments. They sent it to the states to be ratified. When they sent it to the states, at this point, they feel like, guys, we're doing it. We're a nation. We have a president. We have a constitution. We have a Congress. We just did the Bill of Rights. We need to thank God for all that we've accomplished. And so Congress actually went to Washington and said, hey, as a president, we think it's most fitting for you as a leader of this nation to do a prayer proclamation. Washington totally agreed, said, we're going to do it. Well, this was the very first printing of the very first presidential Thanksgiving proclamation where Washington says, we need to take a day and just thank God for all that God's helped us to accomplish for where we are, for what we've done. That's awesome. Well, well, this wasn't just done by presidents. There's also a second thing that comes with this. It's really interesting tradition. We don't follow well today, but it's worth introducing. The pilgrims had that first Thanksgiving. And so, man, they're, they're sitting good, riding good. And so here comes the next spring. They now know from Squanto how to plant, how to harvest, how to, how to get food. And things didn't go like planned because they come into a drought. And so they go through that spring and there's no rain. And if we don't get rain, we don't have corn, we don't have grain, we're gonna starve again. And so they called for a day of humiliation, fasting and prayer. And they did, and it's very interesting that this is now in late spring. You're getting, you're getting towards summertime and you haven't had rain. And so they called for rain and kind of like Elijah, a little cloud appeared in the sky, got bigger, bigger, it rained. Well, and saying they called for rain, they called for a day of prayer and fasting. Yeah, not rain. To they pray for rain. Right. I mean, they were asking they were God to send for rain. rain. And but it was so, a day of prayer and fasting. And also, this is when the natives are paying attention to what the pilgrims are doing yeah. because they know the pilgrims are religious. They've seen them with the Bible. They, they know them as the people of the book. And they've seen them pray many times. But this was a little different because their behavior, their actions, and they saw them openly praying and crying out to God. And as you pointed out, kind of like Elijah, there was just a little cloud, size of a man's fist kind of thing that appears and a gentle spring rain descended. And for 24 hours, there was a soft, gentle rain. Now, if you think about rains that come at that time of the year, they're thunderstorms, they often have hail, they got lightning and you get a pounding of rain, not this. This was more like a fall rain, and that's what got the Indians' attention. And it, there was actually a, an account of a native coming up to one of the pilgrims saying, hey, we've never seen anything like this. Would you teach us what you just did? Because we need to learn how to do that. Hey, man. We think <laughs> that'd be awesome. really beneficial for us. It started a tradition that for the pilgrims, every single fall, they would have a day of prayer and thanksgiving. Every single spring, they would have a time of prayer and fasting. And the prayer and fasting was quite logical for lots of reasons. They would pray that God would help them in the coming year, that God would send rain and provision, that God would help their crops grow. They prayed for a lot of practical things. And then every fall, they would have a day of thanksgiving to thank God for all of his blessings and his goodness. And so this is a tradition that was carried out in all of the New England colonies, most of the colonies in general. And so that second Thanksgiving happened after the first fasting. So you have Thanksgiving mm-hmm. fasting because God answered the prayer on fasting. Now we have a second Thanksgiving. And so that's the, the alternate that you see. Well, so, and this is part of the tradition. This is a, a prayer and fasting proclamation from John Hancock. You see it says, for fasting, humiliation, and prayer. 
what's so interesting about this proclamation to me is when John Hancock calls, there's a specific day in Massachusetts, he says, everybody, we're going to pray and fast on this day. But he says, calling upon ministers and people of every denomination to assemble on that day in their respective congregations that with true contrition of heart, we may confess our sins, resolve to forsake them, and implore the divine forgiveness through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Savior. So not only are we praying for God wow. to do all the other things, we're acknowledging that if people don't know Jesus, we want them to know Jesus. And, and I love these prayer proclamations because it's a really good thing to point people to when they think, well, the founding fathers, they were largely atheists and agnostics and deists. No, just go back and read their prayer proclamations. Yeah. By, by 18, uh, 1815, there were more than 1,400 official prayer proclamations. And, and we have lots of those. This is an example of a... We've only got two minutes left. Oh, here's something I would yes. like you to address. Yes. Is that people say, look how divided America is and look how bad everything is. And yet Lincoln's proclamation, I've read it and yeah. I've actually printed that and put it out. And he talks about, we have been the recipients of such great bounty. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he's talking in the midst of a civil war. Yeah. And yet he established And that the proclamation says nothing about a civil war. All it says is we got to get God. He yeah. says, we've forgotten God. We've forgotten the hand that blessed us. And it is one of the most amazing things. There's nothing bigger than the nation's life right then than the Civil War, and he doesn't even mention it. He just mentions getting back to God, yeah. getting God in the middle of things. And one of the things, too, that, that Moses warned the Israelites when they were going to the Promised Land is be careful that when you are, are living in the abundance of the land, that, that you're drinking water from a cistern you didn't dig, you're eating from the food from the fields that you didn't grow, be careful that you don't forget God. And that's what Lincoln points to is he said, we've just become so fat and yeah. lazy and complacent, we've forgotten God. We've been the benef the beneficiaries of such bounties of heaven, yeah. and he's talking about all of these great things in the midst of the Correct. war that costs right. us more lives than in, any other yeah. war. In the midst of even how bad things are in America right now, one of the things that was very evident is even right now, if we look at Afghanistan and, and some of the things happening with the Taliban now having retaken Afghanistan, they're openly beating and abusing women in the streets, right? They're openly executing and beheading people. Americans have forgotten how broken the rest of the world is and how sinful the world can be without God. America, as, as sinful as we are at times, we are still a nation fundamentally that has a foundation of biblical truth and it's always made us different. And, and our nation is still, we have issues today, but the issues we have is because we are ignoring and rejecting biblical principles. We should be thankful yeah. that we still live in a nation that's the freest, most stable, most prosperous nation in the world, but also that we have a nation where there is religious freedom that we can pursue and seek God and hopefully restore this foundation of biblical truth. And a few months ago, I had both of you all on and we were talking about that we are in the third great awakening mm -hmm. and you can't prove it from the secular side, but I believe, and you've said the same thing, that we believe it's happening, and, and eventually it will become obvious to yes. even the unbelievers, but there's a lot to be praising God for. So I just want to say to all of you who are watching that praise God, this Thanksgiving, we ought to be praising God. Take these truths. I encourage you to get these programs, the materials that we're offering, and share this with other people and let them know that the things that you're hearing, they're just absolute lies. It is a total mischaracterization uh, characterization of things, and, and we are a blessed people. We need to be praising God this Thanksgiving. So we've got a lot of materials. I've got my book entitled The Effects of Praise, and I'm going to be teaching on that on tomorrow's program. I've also got it in DVD, also CDs. We've got the programs that you saw me interview, the Bartons, and those are available. And we also have a little thing from Wall Builders. That's the Bartons Ministry on Thanksgiving in America. And this is just a little history of that. Our announcer will give you all of the information about how you can get these materials so listen, and then please call or write today for these materials. Today, you saw a portion of Andrew's interview with David and Tim Barton as they discuss America's systemically anti-racist heritage. If you'd like more information about David and Tim Barton, visit their website at wallbuilders.com. This entire interview is available in either a CD or DVD album made from our daily television broadcast. You can also get Andrew's three-week series titled The Effects of Praise Today. This series is available as a book or in a CD or DVD album made from our daily television broadcast. Each of these valuable resources are available for a gift of any amount when you contact us. As a special offer, you can get the Thanksgiving in America tract for free today when you write or call. This offer is limited to one free item per household 
and is available in the U.S. and Canada. You can become a Grace Partner through our website at awmi.net. While there, you can discover more product details and download additional free resources. You can also order resources or receive prayer by calling our helpline at 719-635-1111. Our helpline is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. I've got some great news to share with you, and that is that we have now expanded our phone center hours to 24-7. Anytime you want to call us, we're going to be open to receive your calls. We've been expanding gradually, and this is a goal that I've been shooting at, and I'm excited because, you know, sometimes problems, needs don't just wait until business hours to happen. You may need to call in the middle of the night and we can now serve you 24 seven on our Andrew Womack Ministries helpline. You say in the name of Jesus, I'm not going by what I see. I go by what the Word of God says. There's more than just this physical realm. There's also a spiritual realm. I don't care what this looks like. I know what God's Word says. I was told that I would always have severe asthma and food allergies. I was born missing the left side of my heart with a very small chance of living. The doctors indicated that I had a permanent brain injury and that I would never function in mainstream society again. I'm Tim McDermott, and my brother and I were told that we would never recover from autism. From a young age, I had several diagnoses, including Asperger's syndrome, dis-executive syndrome, and communication disorders. My brother James was diagnosed with autism before he turned three. For years, it seemed like we would never be normal. But then my parents stumbled across the healing journey of Hannah Terides. A few weeks later, we went to Andrew's free Grace and Faith conference, where we were healed of autism. Today, 10 years later, I'm still walking in my complete healing, and I am not alone. I haven't needed my inhaler in years, and now I eat whatever I want. My heart grew back its missing piece, and the doctors cannot explain it. Today, I am completely healed, and I get to teach God's truth about healing. Because people like you partnered with Andrew O'Mac Ministries, we have all been given our lives back. We cannot thank you enough for your generosity, but there are still millions of lives out there looking for the same truth that set us free. Will you help us bring this message to them? The word needs to get out to change people's lives. Please consider a partnership. Please partner with this ministry, it's amazing. Please consider being a partner with this ministry. You know, you may not know these people, but I know every one of these people that you just saw them give a testimony. And I tell you, Jesus changed their life because of our partners. If you've not yet joined with us and become a partner, I ask you to pray about it and join with us today.